I'm guilty, I'm guilty, I'm guilty. You'll always be my favorite. I'm guilty, I'm guilty. So we are now moving on to chapter 3, which is sampling and sampling distributions. This is the first lesson for chapter 3. You have the lesson sampling. Our objectives to hit for today is to illustrate random sampling and to distinguish between parameter and statistic. Additional objectives is to identify the sampling method applied in a given situation, recognize the importance of appropriately selecting the sampling method to use, and to create a situation that would apply the given sampling method. So you have seen these posts lingering around Facebook, around Twitter, around Snapchat, around Instagram. So these are what we call a sample survey. So a sample survey is a method of systematically gathering information on a segment of the population, such as or defined as the sample. So from the word itself, sample survey, we survey a sample. So why do you think we just do surveys or interviews on a sample? Why not well just the whole population? The reason why we do sample surveys is because of these five. The first one is the cost. A sample often provides useful and reliable information at a much lower cost than a census. Next, you have timeliness. Timely information because fewer data are to be collected. Next, we have the third one. Accuracy. You may think that surveying the population will yield a better or a more accurate result than those of surveying a sample. However, data errors typically can be controlled in smaller tasks or smaller groups. Next, we have the fifth reason why we do sample and not the whole population because destructive testing. This is when a test involves the destruction of an item. For example, in battery, battery life tests must use sampling because something must be left to send. What can be another example? that involves destructive testing. Let's say uh, the effectivity of a vaccine against the ongoing virus. If I gave you a cup of coffee, just a sip of that cup of coffee will help you determine if it's a good tasting coffee for you or not. You don't need to finish the whole cup. That's the same with samples and population. Testing of blood. You don't need to get the whole blood from a human being or from any other animal just to see if they have immunodeficiencies or sickness. You just need to get a sample of their blood. Now, there is something crucial to determine. We know that the sample is part of the population. So to summarize the features of the population, we use parameters. So what is crucial to design a sample survey that will be a representative of a population it intends to characterize? Typically, people can guarantee representatives in a sample survey if chance methods are used for selecting respondents. Exploring the ways to select a sample statistic from a population, there are two general sampling methods. Probability sampling and non-probability sampling. Let's go to the first one, which is probability sampling. First one under it is what we call simple random sampling. Other times, we call it the lottery method or the fishbowl method. This is because every member of the population has an equal chance of being selected in a sample. Selection also may be with or without replacement. Diba nga, sabi natin, it's the lottery or fishbowl method. Say, I have the names of all the students that I handle in statistics and probability in one bowl. For example, I need 20 respondents, so I get 20 names. If I do not place the names back to the bowl, that's without replacement. But if I get one and then I place it back and then I get another one, that's what we call sampling with replacement. So, binabalik yung pangalan. The second one under probability sampling method is stratified sampling. Population is divided into strata. To determine if you're going to use stratified sampling, there are two questions that you should answer. Are there different groups within the population? Next. Are these differences important to the investigation? Next, you have the third one, which is systematic sampling. When we say systematic sampling, it has a uniform interval, time, order, or space. In the sample size, in, it can be the kth unit. In our example, every third unit. So, yung pangatlo. Fourth one, you have there the cluster sampling. Kanina, stratified sampling into strata homogeneous groups within a population. Ito naman, these are clusters. Okay? You select a random sample of clusters, then subjects the sampled clusters to enumeration. So clusters in the population may be based on convenience, 
in collection of the data by the environment. For example, for village, my clusters can be my blocks of houses. For schools, my clusters can be sections. For dormitory, my clusters can be rooms. For city or municipality, my clusters could be barangays. The reason why we conduct cluster sampling, it's because so that data collected need not come from a huge geographic range. For instance, instead of getting a simple random sample of households from all over a town, clusters of dwellings can be selected from different barangays so that the cost of data collection can be minimized. So that is it for our probability sampling methods. There are just four of them. So question before we move on to non-probability sampling method, are polls on voting preferences through SMS messages and Facebook posts, Instagram posts, Twitter posts adequate to represent actual voting preference? Not all voters have cell phones, especially among the poor. It's not everyone has internet access. Kahit ngayong online learning tayo, meron pa rin mga schools, may mga students na are undergoing only modular learning. And certainly, not every Filipino voter has a Facebook account. In addition, a mere random selection of mobile phone numbers or of Facebook users will in no way assure you of its representativeness of the voting population. This is an example of a non-probability sampling method. Going to non-probability sampling method, we have the first one, which is haphazard sampling. Okay? It's accidental sampling. It is unsystematic. Some disciplines like archaeology, history, and even medicine draw conclusions from whatever items are made available. Some disciplines like astronomy, experimental physics, and chemistry often do not care about the representativeness of their specimens. So that falls under haphazard sampling. Next, we have convenient sampling. Well, one of the most popular sampling methods to use, it is convenient to the researcher. So, kaya ganyan yung picture natin, it's because convenient sampling is for circle of friends and acquaintances. So, what is convenient to the researcher, yun yung mga sample na kinukuha nila. Next, we have the third one, which is volunteer sampling. From the word voluntary itself, sample units are volunteers in studies. Part one, you have purposive sampling. Also, one of the most common sampling methods to use, purposive sampling, it is to select a sample based on the expert's own subjective assessment. It can also be the researcher's own subjective assessment. We do purposive sampling if you have a specific purpose or specific characteristics to collect from our sample. So what is the difference between convenient sampling and purposive sampling? What may be convenient to the researcher may not be purposeful. What may be purposeful to the researcher may not be convenient. Next, you have the fifth one, which is quota sampling. This design is especially used in market research, kaya spam yan. A comparative analysis between two subgroups can be observed using the quota sampling technique. There are cases also where two subgroups, which don't have any common element, exhibit extremely interconnected traits. In such cases, this sampling method can be extremely beneficial. Kunwari, comparing spam to brand A. Comparing your toothpaste A to toothpaste B. So that falls under quota sampling. Next, we have number six, the last non-probability sampling method, which is snowball sampling. Okay? So while sampling, additional sample units are identified by asking previously picked sample units for people they know who can be added to the sample. Kunwari, I interviewed you about this. I gave you a survey to answer. And then I ask you, share naman sa mga friends mo, sa mga classmates mo, sa mga batchmates mo. That's what we call snowball sampling. Starting from one, it escalates or snowballs to another respondent. Snowball sampling is used when the topic is not common or the population well is hard to access. So before we summarize, why do you think it is important to identify the appropriate sampling method to use? Identifying the appropriate sampling method to use can greatly help us in our research to eliminate bias and to make sure that the data we have collected is verified and valid. 
there are two sampling methods generally you have probability sampling method and non-probability sampling method under probability sampling method we have four simple random the lottery method or fishbowl method stratified sampling where your population is divided into strata next you have systematic sampling every tenth unit every third unit every kth unit Next, you have the last one, which is cluster sampling, where your population is divided into clusters. The next one, you have non-probability sampling method. We have six. You have haphazard or accidental sampling. Convenient sampling, convenient to the researcher. Next, volunteer sampling. Sample units are volunteers. Purposive sampling, purposeful to the researcher. Next, the fifth one, you have quota sampling used in market research. And then sixth one, the snowball sampling. Starting from one, snowballing to another sample. So that is it for our chapter three, lesson one, done. So now this is a sample for the future lessons to come. So we review your sampling methods and also the, the previous lessons since we're going into the next lesson.